I guess I've made a big thing out of saying that I started when I was 15, and since I found the notebook a few years ago uh, with three or four stories written in it, that's true, I did. And I did tell my grandfather that I was going to write him a book called The Round Barn. And I don't remember whether I had actually written down those little stories first or afterwards. The silo has the, uh, the aims of this farm painted on it. And they're worth getting down onto your, your tape here, which is uh, he built the round barn and then the silo that's the core of the round barn. Uh, he painted the aims of this farm. Uh, good crops, proper storage, profitable livestock, a stable market, life as well as a living. And we grew up under that. Uh, I have two earlier books, one called Stories from the Round Barn and the other More Stories from the Round Barn. And this is because Reg Gibbons, who at that time was an editor at Triquarterly and at the University Press, the Northwestern University Press, uh, heard my stories and wanted to publish my book. And I said, you haven't even read my book. And he said, uh, that's okay, we want to publish it anyway, and here's what we'll do. We'll pull out some of the stories and do them in a smaller volume until you finish the larger volume. So that was fine, and the, the book did very well for the press. And he says it's the most beautiful book they ever published, those two round barn books, uh, because it wasn't ready yet when they wanted another one. So that was more stories. Uh, I sent out letters to people saying, tell me what you remember about the farm. Uh, I began seeing people, interviewing people, and especially talking to my dad, because he had gone, he had gone into the hospital. Uh, at just at the time when he closed the dairy. And I think the, the things were related, like he was letting down his father by so forth. But it was for fortunate because within two years, retail home delivery had dissolved all over the country. And, uh, for, for milk delivery? For, for milk delivery. And uh, so I, I flew in three or four times from Ohio and sat at his bedside in the hospital and took down his stories. And then I began gathering other people's stories, too. So that this book is a compilation of a lot of people's stories. It's not my memoir. I'm in it as a, as a character. Uh, and it's told in third person, so it's Jackie, not I. Uh, I don't think you'll find any eyes except in the introduction, where I explain about having so much material. And uh, I kept on working on it. Uh, I had high gear. It really began in high gear in 1967 because my grandfather died when I was 20 and I hadn't gathered his stories. And then I'd gone on, you know, with a difficult marriage and, and four wonderful kids uh, and working. And, uh, and then we had a divorce and, uh, you know, there was just, and I was writing other things. Uh, and this was always in the back of my mind, and then I had a sabbatical here at, at uh, uh, University, uh, Sangamon State it was at that point, and I was co-teaching with Phil Kendall, Ch History of Children's Lit, and he says, Jackie, you're never going to write that book. And uh, I said, I'll show you. And so on my sabbatical, <laughs> I began in earnest, because the problem was how to organize the in tremendous mass of material that there was. And in the beginning of the book, I say it in the other two books too, how come there is so much material? Well, a lot, a lot of it is because my grandpa kept meticulous records and so did my father. But also because grandpa was deaf, uh, people wrote to him. And sometimes in order to carry on a conversation later, uh, grandpa would sit down and write down his thoughts and have them present, say, to his son, who went into business with him, my dad. And, uh, and then they could go from there. And a lot of those have been preserved. Uh, some actually deliberately preserved in folders about something, and others just kicking around. I learned to look everywhere when I finally began looking. I discovered that people stick letters behind pictures, behind framed pictures. So I got looking behind framed pictures to find letters. And on the attic floor, there were loose pieces of paper with silverfish having eaten parts of them, but I could still, de I picked them up, you know, that was towards the end when my folks had died and we were clearing the house. Here are stray sheets of paper, and I would look at it and I'd say, why, this fits right in with 
if you could read it, but then I could reconstruct it pretty well. So it's been a, it's been a fun book as a detective, what's the word I want? As a, as a search for clues and information. And something that I wrote about 20 years ago or 25 years ago, uh, I will find a piece that fits in a puzzle piece and I say, I now understand what I was writing about then. I can, I can rewrite that chapter and include this bit and it now makes much better sense. Uh, the first book, they called it a memoir, and I argued with Reg and with Northwestern. I said, look, it's not a memoir. And, uh, but Ellie said to me, Mom, memoirs are all the rage right now. She said, forget about it. Just go along with it as a memoir. But it's really a memoir of the farm. It's a history of farming uh, in the Midwest from 1900 to 1972 or so. And I put in, in the front, that I am well aware of agribusiness and CAFOs and, and uh, lack of diversity and all these agricultural problems, which were just beginning there in the 60s and the 70s. And, uh, and so I didn't want people to think that this was just a nostalgia thing, a walk down memory lane, and wasn't it wonderful to be growing up on this place, which it was, of course. But, uh, but I wanted them to know that it's, it's, it's more than that. And uh, it's not a sentimental book. It started out as nine books and we've combined it into three volumes, each of approximately three books. Uh, the first section we've changed into a kind of a general introduction for each book so that it's uh, now eight books in three volumes. And so we start in the middle. Uh, with the silo and the barn uh, for the stories and then uh, that's that's book one and in volume one and then book two is the milk house where the milk is processed and in book three is the milk routes where you're delivering milk in in town and nearby environs so that's the first book and then it says here I thought it would be a good idea to put it in and it is there volume two will contain book four the big house that's where the uh, hired men lived and grandpa and grandma and we were in and out of there every day when we lived down the home place. And then book five is uh, all the crops and hybrid seed corn, the crop stories, which aren't prominent in this first book. And then book six is uh, Ron's home place. We put that instead of Shea New. Uh, and the American Breeders Service, which is when we got into the artificial breeding business. So that's, uh, that's the second volume, and then the third volume is really the state, the nation, and the world, as it says in the last one there, except that the chapter before that is the neighbors, the town, and the county. Uh, I could say the neighbors, the town, and the township, and the county, but it was getting pretty long at that point. And uh, so, so the stories are scattered uh, throughout uh, and are not chronological. Uh, but are geographical. Uh, this has made a problem with some of the history ones, um, and in some ways I've stuck the history in sort of chronologically, even though I haven't said that, uh, so that uh, so that you get the history, more of the history early on, and uh, and then I've divided my grandpa's stuff into stuff that was written about him, which in this book is called good copy. And then there's the things he wrote. And so I thought, do I put them all together in a chunk or not? And uh, Roland and I thought about it a lot and decided, no, let's put in separately what he wrote where it belongs in the, in the geographical context. So we have about Grandpa and then Grandpa's own writing. And I have since realized that Ronald, my dad, was also good copy and my mother was good copy. So in volume two, I'm I've got a few things yet to write for volume two. And uh, one of them is to put in Ron, Ron is good copy. Well, I don't know what I'll call him, but that's the, that's the uh, plan. Uh, I've got three or four more things to write for volume two and it's finished. Uh, but uh, self-publishing is becoming so much more legit because of what's happening in the publishing world and because of how well you can self-publish. And uh, I don't know what this is doing to the vanity presses like Vantage and so forth that have always been the, mm -hmm. the vanity presses and have had some value. 
and every now and then they bring out a good book, but also some of my book reviews, I've taken things that would have gone to a vanity press, and I said, look, this has its value for this family, for this family's friends, for the people that flew planes in World War, whatever, you know, so it isn't a, 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 a big volume, or I don't say a first-rate volume, but I mean, I say it's a valuable volume, mm -hmm. and it is self-published. But then there's other things that are self-published, like this, uh, which is a very good book, and, and Reg is unstinting in his praise of it, and he's the head of all the writing at Northwestern and has a national reputation, so who am I to, to uh, be modest about it? I'm not. It's a good book. <laughs> But and well worth reading no matter where you open it. I mean, if you, uh, so you think you don't like a history of milk bottles, well, start reading about the history of milk bottles and I think you'll find it sort of fun.